Oh, let's pray. Creator God, you breathe life into all of us. Empower and encourage us to breathe life into every living thing. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. Looking at the age group we have here today, I'm betting that some of you have heard of a daytime show called As the World Turns. <laughs> yes? That show was on for 54 years. I almost said 24. No, 54 years As the World Turns was on the air. And week after week, people would tune in to see what was going to happen, which was usually very, very little. Right? Did you ever wonder why those daytime dramas are called soap operas? I'm the only one that thinks about these things? Okay. Opera, because they originally started as radio programs that were broad broadcast. And soap, because the audience was always women who were at home cleaning the house, and they were sponsored by soap companies. See what you learn in church? Isn't that fun? Now, as the world turns and all of those soap operas like it are high emotion shows with low action. You can watch that show for 30 minutes and almost nothing will happen. But right at the end, there will be a question and you'll have to tune in the next day to find out if maybe that day something will happen. Will Madge finally realize that she is so in love with Roger? Oh, we still don't know, but we do have a shot now of Roger looking at Beverly. Oh, no. So we have to tune in the next day. And again, almost nothing happens. High emotion, low energy, which is sort of how we look at climate change. That's how we talk about it. Lots of emotion and very little action. Unlike our reading today, that is filled with action, God was very busy in our reading, taking all of this chaos and ordering it into creation. And I want us to pay attention to just one verse out of everything that Jim read for us. Thank you, Jim. Verse 28, where God gives humans a job. And the job is to subdue and have dominion over the earth. Subdue and have dominion. Now, according to Professor um, Craig Nesson, the Hebrew word for uh, subdue, where we get our translation subdue, that word means many different things. It also means assault, enslave, force, and tread upon. And the word for dominion the Hebrew word there also has other meanings, and those meanings are to exert authority, to take, and to tread upon, power over. And so the picture we get is a picture of a boot on someone's back. And that should trouble us, because it troubles me. I've been wondering all of my life, as I read the Bible stories, what was there to subdue? The earth was brand new in this story, wasn't it? Nobody ate each other. There's no violence, there's no people, but two that we know of, right? Subdue? You can see now why, why the translators chose subdue instead of assault or enslave. The choices weren't good. And that causes us, us to have some trouble with it because as people of God, we are called to love God and love our neighbor as we love ourselves. And meanwhile, we are enslaving and assaulting all of creation. That can't be right, can it? Now, fortunately for us, there's Genesis chapter two. And we know that Genesis Chapter 1 and Genesis chapter 2 are two different creation stories. Rabbi um, Brad Hirschfield shares with us that, and I have shared with us before, maybe we remember, that Genesis chapter 1 is a song or a poem. Then God said, and it was good. Then God said, and it was good. 
It has a rhythm to it. But chapter two is very different. Chapter two and chapter one are completely different stories. And if you don't believe me, your homework this afternoon is to sit down with those stories and look at them side by side. They have a different language and a different voice and different commandments for humans. Now, the rabbi says that the difference in these two stories is God's gift to us. It is a gift that at the very beginning of the Hebrew scripture, we have two different stories that invite us into conversation. This book is showing us what we're going to find as we read further. It's setting the stage for a dialogue. It's telling us this book is not about one right way to be in the world, but this is a book that shows potential ways to be in the world. And it calls us into the conversation. So let's go there now. Let's go to Genesis chapter two. You can all look this up this afternoon when you are at home. Verse 15, God tells humans what their job is. And it is to till and to keep. They are placed in a garden and God says to till and to keep. Now here the Hebrew words uh, where we get the word till means also to tend and to serve. And the, the word keep that we translate keep, that Hebrew word also means to protect and to guard. So, which is it? Are we Genesis 1 people or are we Genesis 2 people? Are we going to subdue and have dominion over or are we going to till and to keep? Are we going to assault and enslave and tread upon or are we going to serve and protect? Don't you love the Bible? We are welcomed into this conversation so that we can talk about it with the text. Now I think this question about what kind of person we are, what kind of follower of Christ we are, is at the crux of our climate conversation. Because this question that I raised for you between Genesis 1 and Genesis 2 is a question of privilege or responsibility. What are our rights? Don't we have the right to just live the way we want to live or do we have the responsibility to love all of creation? Now in my, uh, in my study, in my conversation with people, I've come across three different types of Christians when it comes to climate change. The first says flat out, it's just a hoax, it's not happening. And today we're not going to give them any airtime because the data suggests differently. The second kind of Christian says, yep, it's happening. We see that the weather is getting weirder. We know that there's erosion uh, caused by excessive sea level rise. But it's not our fault. It's seasonal. It's natural. There's absolutely nothing we can do to change it. And then the third kind of Christian is the one that says, yes, the data is showing there is climate change and we are responsible. There are things that we can do, and we need to do them. So we see this difference in looking at climate change, and it centers around the question, whose fault is it? And that's not the right question for us this morning. I want to offer you a better question, a question that you can take home with you and think about. And that question is, is the earth our neighbor? We are called as people of God to love God, to love our neighbors, and to love one another as we love ourselves. And in our story this morning, isn't creation our very first neighbor? Every living thing and the planet itself. And if the earth is our neighbor, how do we treat her? Now I want you to sit with that question and I'm not going to answer it because we have someone here much more knowledgeable than I who's going to come now and prepare to share with us. We welcome this morning Mary Garten 
from CCL, that's Citizens Climate Lobby, which is a nonprofit, grassroots, nonpartisan group for change. And Mary shared with me that 20 some years ago, she knew about climate change, but she, like many of us, thought somebody would do something. Someone in our government, for example, might do something about climate change. But she realized five years ago that nothing was happening. It was like another episode of as the world turns, high emotion, low action. No one was doing anything. And so Mary became involved with Citizens Climate Lobby, and she found that one person can make a difference. And that each of us, even though we feel like this problem is so big, each of us can do something. And so today she's going to share a presentation with us. We're gonna go about 10 minutes over time, but when uh, she is finished and we close our service today, she will join us for our coffee hour to answer your questions. Okay, Mary, are you all ready? Hi, everybody. Oops, is that on? Oops. Okay, it's not, it's not all the way down. Let me, let me move back here. Is that better? Can you all hear me? Um, could I get uh, host privileges, please? Hi, everyone. In the meantime, it's been such a privilege and an honor to be here in your uh, lovely, lovely um, Christian sanctuary community that, I mean, I felt very welcome, and your service has spoken so much to my heart. Um, I, as uh, Reverend Judy said, um, taking care of our brothers and sisters has become my passion. It's what I do um, in all of my volunteer time now. And I am distressed about what's happening in the planet, but I don't let that get to me because in reality there's, there's a lot that can be done and that is the better approach. As the song said, our tears are not helpful if we look away, if we turn away. We need to turn towards the problem. So I'd like to share my screen for a second. And there you go. Um, I am sharing you a picture that I took, which is probably why it's not the highest quality you've ever seen. Um, hang on. I've there we go. I was having a glitch. <laughs> okay. So thank you all. I'm really excited to be here. My name, as Reverend Judy said, is Mary Garten. I'm coming from the Ann Arbor chapter of Citizens Climate Lobby. And that's a volunteer group of people that is trying to come together to do something about climate change. Uh, because it's fall, I wanted to share uh, that picture of you, which I took last fall, um, to this part of Michigan, if you can see what I did there, um, there, um, to find the herds of elk. And I don't know if you know this, but see what you learn in church, um, that there's about a thousand elk that roam free and wild up here in this area. And it's gorgeous in the fall. Whenever I carve time out to look at the beauty of nature and earth, I marvel at what a gift it is just to be here. So the relationships between plants and creatures work together, and each one has a part to play. And I'm reminded that we are stewards of this beautiful planet. And we do affect the lives of all of these creatures by what we do, but we also affect ourselves as well. We injure our brothers and sisters when we knock nature out of balance. So this is our beautiful home, which is showing signs of strain from climate change because we've been changing the atmosphere. So I would like to share some of what Citizens Climate Lobby, that's my volunteer organization, and what you could do to actually make a difference to protect our home. So 
as an overview, Citizens Climate Lobby is just a volunteer organization, and we come from all walks of life. We are nonpartisan, although, as you'll see, we work in the political arena. We don't label ourselves. Um, but Congress obviously has labels, but we are nonpartisan. We welcome everybody. We have politically conservative people, politically liberal people. It really doesn't matter. We just want people who care about climate change. And we're focused on national action. Now, I do want to spend five minutes talking generally about climate change. I might even cut that shorter. What's happening and why it matters. And this is kind of a bad news story, but it's only five minutes. And then I promise I will move on to the better news. So here's the problem. Over the last 100 years, we've been using a lot of energy that comes from burning coal, oil, and gas. Now, when you burn these fuels, carbon dioxide is released into the air. And right now, there's 50% more carbon dioxide in the air than there was in the pre-industrial age. So every molecule of carbon dioxide traps warmth. And so it makes sense, and it's true, that when you get more carbon dioxide in the atmosphere, and each one is trapping more warmth, the planet is going to heat up, and that's what has happened. So 21 of the 22 hottest years ever measured have been since the year 2002. And the last nine years have been the hottest nine years since records started to be taken in the 1800s. Now, the average global temperature for the last 140 years is right there on the midline. You can see that. So the warming trend is super clear. A lot of people don't know that heat waves cause more deaths in the US than any other weather event. And the people who are most vulnerable to these increasing temperatures are the homeless, low income, infants, children and elderly, those with pre-existing conditions, mentally ill, and people who work outdoors. Now this extra heat that's in the air evaporates water and that causes droughts to take hold quicker and last longer all over the world. So these are dry reservoirs in South Korea and South Africa. And I want to stop for a second and say, I belong to climate reality and I have hundreds of slides, but I'm condensing a three hour talk into five minutes. So there are more, but I'm not showing them. So 10 years ago, the US Defense Department said that climate change would likely lead to food and water shortages, pandemic disease, disputes over refugees and resources, and destruction by natural disasters in regions across, across the globe. So an example of this prediction coming true was the severe drought in Syria that forced people who lost their farms to, to flood into those already crowded cities, which caused turmoil in the cities, leading to the Syrian civil war, which led to the Syrian refugee crisis, after which people in Britain became uncomfortable with being forced to take in so many refugees and elected to leave the European Union. Climate change exacerbates problems, which domino into other problems. And this is what the Defense Department was talking about. Unfortunately, the number of climate refugees is going to increase due to extreme temperatures, flooding, and food insecurity. Wildfire seasons all over the world are now longer than they were. They have been burning more acres than they used to and burning hotter. This trend has been happening all over the world, even if we don't hear about it. These are just a few photos of gazillions from Croatia, Portugal, Chile, and France. Thousands of people are left homeless in these fires. Now, I've been talking so far only about heat waves, droughts, and fires. These are all the obvious heat-related things, but there is another side to the coin. That same heat that evaporates water from the soil, which is causing the droughts and the heat waves and the wildfires in one place, is also evaporating more water from the ocean, which is why hurricanes have been stronger and they dump more water than they used to. Microbursts like this are becoming more common because warmer air holds more water. It's got more energy. 
So this is a graph of record-breaking precipitation anomalies. In easier speak, it means these are extreme weather events, not normal, extreme weather events. Globally, these record-breaking anomalies of extreme rainfall in 2016 occurred five times more often than 1980. And I'm going to highlight 1980. You can see it's not the, the lowest on that list there, but it happens to be when I was in middle school. And then you put it up against 2016, and you can see twice as many, three times as many, four times as many, five times as many extreme record-breaking storms as in 1980. And this graph start, stops at 2016, but it took a lot of work for me to animate it, so I don't want to update it. <laughs> but the graph continues to go up. So that's why we're saying extreme weather events, extreme rainfall is the new normal. Okay? And extreme rainfall has caused lots of flooding all over the US. This is Louisville. Um, but worryingly, we've had Superfund sites flood like this one in Alabama that was contaminated with mercury, DDT, and other toxics. And there's always the worry of heavy metals from coal ash or oil, like here, spilling into to the floodwaters. You see the water level there. Hurricane Harvey resulted in more than 100 toxic chemical releases. Over in Australia last year, look at this town with this beautiful church. You can see I pointed to the roof of the BP gas station, which is all you can see of it there. More than 600 people died, and one and a half million people were displaced in Nigeria and Chad last year. I didn't hear about it on the news, but it happened. Last year, a third of Pakistan was underwater, with more than 1,700, 1700 people killed, and 33 million people affected. Also, I didn't hear about that in the news. The damages amounted to 10% of their national GDP. Hundreds of thousands of people were left homeless in this storm in India, and so on. The World Health Organization has called climate change the single biggest health threat facing humanity. And as Pope Francis said, the gravest effects of all attacks on the environment are suffered by the poorest, who have, by the way, done the least of anybody to cause the problem. And all of this is why it's imperative not to give up. And, as she said in the song, not to look away. So, stopping climate change means we've got to reduce our use of coal, oil, and gas as fast as possible. What that means is, as you'll see in the, the near term, electrify everything. That is the goal of all the people who are talking about climate change. When something is electric, it doesn't release exhaust. So your phone doesn't emit fumes up into your face when you use it, right? And electric cars don't either. You can lie down behind an electric car and it'll all be just fine. Gasoline engines, on the other hand, release air pollution, which aggravates asthma, lung and heart conditions, dementia, I don't know if you knew that, and even diabetes. Not to mention the climate change problem that I've been talking about. Gas stoves emit benzene, which is linked to cancer and also climate change. So the more things that are electric, the fewer health damaging toxic gases and global warming gases will be put into the air. So keep in mind first, electric tools are clean. Or rather, they're only clean, they're clean at the place where they're being used, okay? To be truly clean, the source of the electricity needs to be clean too. Otherwise, you're just relocating the exhaust from your car to the air around the dirty power plants, right? And most power plants are located near poor and minority communities who already suffer disproportionate levels of illness from the pollution emitted by these plants. So we need to do both things at the same time. You need to electrify everything on one hand, everything you can, and then you also need to make sure that the electricity comes from renewable sources like wind and solar. And I'm gonna digress for a second. There was a bill passed last August that gave $320 billion to incentives to help people um, with climate issues, among which was incentivizing electric. I have a flyer in the back that has two columns worth of things that people can do that 
are incentivized that have a cash benefit that the government will pay for and how to access that money so that you can convert some of your things to electric and receive rebates or incentives. So, but we also need to use less energy in general because, well, especially in the near future while we make the transition, remember that the cleanest energy is the energy that wasn't used at all. So here's a list of things that you may not have thought about to save energy. First of all, use energy efficient appliances and use less water, okay? Reduce the size of your lawn. Natural plants with deep roots are better at directing water to the water table, which means they reduce flooding. Um, they also use less water and they don't require fertilizers, which happen to be super energy intensive to make, and they don't need to be mowed. So reducing your turf in your, your grass is a quadruple win for climate. Um, obviously driving less, bike, walk, take the bus sometimes, combine errands, you know, that stuff. Fly less, it's better for the environment to drive or take a train or a bus. Washing your clothes in cold works perfectly well. Um, turn down your water heater. Improve the insulation on your windows and attic so you're not using so much energy to heat your home. And use LED bulbs. And then people don't realize we waste a lot of energy transporting food long distances. Liquids are heavy to transport. And I'm talking about like the juices from Florida. Refrigerated or freezer trucks use a lot of energy. Try to eat more locally grown food and eat less meat. Now this is actually a very impactful choice for reasons that are too complicated to get into, but even just reducing your meat is helpful. Beef and lamb are very high carbon choices. And don't waste food. The United Nations says that if food waste was classified as a nation, it would rank as the third biggest emissions polluter in the world. So I get asked a lot, of all these things we, I could do to reduce my emissions, what is the one thing that would make the most difference? And I'll tell you the answer. Electrify and conserve energy in every way you can. That goes without saying. But nothing on this list by itself makes as big an impact as you hope it will. Because you're still only one person. And reducing your own emissions is a drop in the bucket when you consider there are 320 million adult Americans who also need to reduce their emissions. So really, the single biggest thing you can do to stop climate change is to focus on making it possible for the whole country to transition to renewable energy. And that means working to get laws passed that make it easier and cheaper for everybody and all industries to do their part. Now, state, county, and local laws are super important, but CCL volunteers don't really go there. We focus on the national level, and we focus on Congress. And we do that in a variety of ways. Some of our wonkier experts and volunteers get into the weeds of policy, and they explain them to the rest of us average people in forums like this one, or in training, we, there are so many trainings and webinars that you can take to learn more. But honestly, most people may table at fairs or festivals to educate the public about the legislation we support. Or they might write a letter to the editor, right? Some of our volunteers lobby members of Congress. I do that. Uh, we try to have constructive conversation with all congressional offices. They're Democrat, they're Republican, they're independent. I know that they're very partisan, but we come there without all of that. We come there looking for common ground, we don't bring animosity, and we try to work constructively towards solutions. So our volunteers cover the political spectrum. We are nonpartisan, and that means that a bunch of us together may not agree on every issue, but we don't talk about those issues. We work together on climate. So most CCL volunteers don't do everything I just said. They pick and choose what they want to do. But the one thing that we want everybody to do is to make phone calls or emails to Congress. Most people think that a call or an email to Congress couldn't possibly help. I mean, that might be true. Okay, One phone call to, from an ordinary constituent might not make any difference at all. But when you join forces, with thousands of other people who call or email with the same message, 
you reach the threshold that catches their attention. Congressional offices tell us, my daughter told me she worked in a congressional office as well, She's, but we've heard from other congressional offices. They literally count the number of calls. And if they reach a, a certain threshold, they inform the member of Congress that their constituents are really interested in this, this thing that they're all calling about. So members of Congress who are climate champions have told us that this constituent mobilization matters a lot. So we at CCL supported the Inflation Reduction Act, and we've shown similar strong support. We come out in droves on many other bills that have been made into law. We have a lot of success, actually. So I think calling is like voting between elections. You could vote every two or four years, or even three times a year like I do. I hit them all. And you think you've made your voice heard, and that's it. But you can vote more than that. When you call or email, you're effectively voting between those elections, because you're telling your representatives what you want them to care about. And you could read from a well-researched and carefully written argument that you spent all night writing, but you do not have to. You can say the minimum just to get that vote counted. For example, try this. Hello, this is Mary Garten. I'm a constituent and I live in Ann Arbor at 1234 Five Mile Road. I'm calling because I want you to support HR 5744, the Energy Innovation Act, because it's the best approach to reducing emissions at the speed and scale that's necessary. Thank you. And then you hang up. Now, you could say more if you wanted to, and you could probably say less than that too. My daughter's favorite call that she took once was somebody who just said, build the wall, period. It was cast as a vote. It was tallied, okay? So you, could, you can probably say less. But that was 17 seconds what I just did, and it's good enough. Now, you'll probably be leaving your message on voicemail anyway, so there's no need to get nervous. And if you really don't like talking on the phone to people, you can call at 1 in the morning, as I have done, and you'll be guaranteed to get a voicemail. So it's really easy. Don't sweat it. If you sign up, CCL will send you an action alert every month. And these are timed to strategically respond to what's happening right now in Washington, DC, and which bills would be benefited from a timely boost of supportive calls. So if you signed up, you'd be sent an action alert. You'd click on the link, and you'd enter your name and your address. The system will do the rest of the work for you. It will use your address to identify your member of Congress, and it'll give you their phone numbers, or it'll give you space to write your little note, which two sentences is fine. It will add the proper greeting, it'll put on a subject line, it'll add the salutation, and it will send it to the correct representative once you say send. So basically, type in your name and address, do a tiny bit more work, and it'll take care of all the formalities. They're trying to make it easy for you and me to be one little snowflake in an avalanche, because the avalanche is what we want. What sorts of bills does CCL support? I mean, before you call for us or with us, maybe you want to know. We look for bills that are big and impactful. We're not trying to bite around the margins here, okay? We're aware of the scale and speed that emissions need to get reduced. Poor and vulnerable people should not bear the cost of this energy transition. It shouldn't hurt the economy. It shouldn't be easily reversible by the next election, the next president, whoever he or she may be. It should support choice and not remove choices. Um, and I don't know how wonky I'm going to get, but I will say the single most important bill we support is the Energy Innovation Act. This is a way of pricing carbon that stimulates the economy and protects low-income populations from the cost of this energy transition. And it also protects US businesses from international trade. I'm not going to explain further because it's a sanctuary, it's a long talk. But you can learn more about it at CCL's website, or I made a video that explains it, and if you email me, I'll send you a link to that, or whatever. But I, I will tell you this much. This graph tells the story. Okay, this is the good news. Our emissions need to go down, and that purple line is the trajectory that we have to get to, right? And this red line is the trajectory we're on. Okay, so that's the scary news. 
We need to dramatically reduce our emissions to get down to there to avoid an awful lot of catastrophe. The good news is that this bill that we support so much that I can explain to you at another date, these, are the, these green dots are the projections and the targets for that Energy Innovation Act, okay? They get us 80% of the way with just this one bill. And then other legislation can pick up the last 20%, and that is based on models from many universities. Um, I don't really want to go through this, but if you just look at the numbers and let yourself get overwhelmed for a minute, all of these economists, former chairs of the Federal Reserve, Democrats and Republicans alike, Nobel laureate economists, et cetera, et cetera, all signed the largest statement in history of economists saying that this plan is exactly the most cost-effective way to reduce emissions at the scale and speed that we need, and that it would protect lower income people from extra costs. In fact, the, what they signed said that the majority of low-income people would end up financially better off, not just the same, but better off if we pass such a thing, because there's a carbon cash back involved. Um, the models show that 67% of Americans would end up with more money in their pockets than, than they had before. And we would address climate change. What could go wrong? I mean, we support this. Another hot topic happens to be permitting reform. Just so you know, Republicans and Democrats don't agree on all aspects, but there is some common ground, and this is a hot topic right now. So the deal is, if we're going to ask everybody to electrify everything, we need to make sure that that electricity is available to them. Because if it's not, we have to fire up the dirty power plants that are in those neighborhoods and pollute the air over there and worsen climate change. It's not a good situation. We have to have more electricity, which means we have to permit more solar farms, wind farms, and transmission lines. So permitting reform does have to happen. It's not a bad word, um, but we have to be careful. You should know that the reason permitting is so inefficient and takes an average of 10 years to permit a new transmission line is kind of by design. Um, environmentalists didn't want uh, dirty projects to go ahead, and so they, they made it really inefficient to permit, but now that's kind of getting in the way. So we don't want to green light bad projects. We just want to get reasonable streamlining passed. Um, there are many bills being discussed. So my goal for this talk was to highlight for all of you that the crisis of climate change with the acceleration that we've been seeing this decade is going to impact all of your neighbors and all of your brothers and sisters around the world who are going to be dealing with weather catastrophes that you and I will never hear about in the news. So we can and we must do what we can about this. So nature is out of balance due to our burning of fossil fuels, and we need to move away from that deadly fuel source and onto clean energy for the sake of all the people, animals, plants, and the creation that surrounds us, both for our own sakes and because we're stewards of this beautiful world, and because we're the ones who caused this problem, and we also have the tools we need to fix it. We just need to convince the right people to do it. Ordinary citizens in the United States have more power than almost any other citizen in any other country because of our position in the world and our position in trade. You and I are in the unique and I say lucky position of having outsized influence compared to our numbers. 90% of winning is just showing up. It's really true in politics. Winning on climate change means showing up. It means demanding the implementation of the technologies that we already have. But making those demands to the right people, not just your neighbor, but the people who can make the decisions, and making that demand in a way that's influential to them. It's not helpful to just lament among ourselves how bad climate change is. Instead, call your member of Congress and let them know how you feel, because they're the ones who can do something about it. So my ask is to please ask yourself, do you have just three to four minutes every month to make your voice heard by joining with ours for national legislation? And if you have more time, super. <laughs> There's a lot to do. But um, 
Those phone calls are not insignificant. They're very helpful. My email address is on the screen in case you want to talk further. I'll be there in the back also available to talk with you. I brought some old business cards with my contact information. Anyway, we can rise to this occasion, and I pray that we do. Thank you so much for letting me have the time. Mary, we thank you so much, and we'll give you a minute for you and Patrick to work things out so that we can all rise in body or spirit, whatever works better, and sing our sending music. And then please stay afterward to ask questions and to pick up some materials that Mary brought with her. Um, I hope our question today was answered. Is the earth our neighbor? And if she is, how do we best care for her? Oh, there's an insert for this song in your bulletins if you have one. song is carried on monarch's wings Over desert, forest, and lake In the wind, the melody sings Love to earth, love to 